Before I jump into this presentation, I would like to remind you, or let you know, this will be videotaped. Peter back there working the cameras and end up putting this out on YouTube. And uh, because of that, if you have a question during the presentation, if you could please speak up, use your outside voice, be loud, or raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so we can get the audio on the video. Um, also, in my preparation, my final preparation for this presentation, I went online to look at last year's video. And uh, I was in my office at home, and I had to run into my, my son, heard my voice, and I heard the computer. He came running into my office, and he said, is that you, Dad? I said, yeah. He said, did you go viral? He said, no. I got 280 views. He came around to the corner of my desk. He said, how many likes did you get? I looked down at him. He said, I got one like. He said, oh, you got one like that? He said, yeah. I didn't get any dislikes. So I'm, I'm at a thousand, right? He looks at me with that look, you know, that, yeah, yeah, that's not how this works. He likes it out of my office and says, mom, dad only got one like on his YouTube video. So, you could help me out there this year, that would be the best appreciated. <laughs> shoot for five, ten days. If I can quad people that, that would be great. So, all right, let's get into this. Air safety investigation. I will talk a little bit about the department, very short and brief, a quick introduction about who we are, what we do. I'm going to go to the 2018 accidents for you. I'm going to show you all the notifications that we received, and pretty brief, some of the trend items that we see within the citation checks. And I'm going to take you to the whole 2018 citation accidents. And at the end of the preliminary briefs of the 18 accidents, we had our own company incident with gratitude, Serial 26, our demo aircraft in November, where the pilot was forced to land the aircraft with the most landing gear retracted. So I'll take you through that investigation of the emergency house because there were no injuries and no real substantial damage to the aircraft. The NTSB did not get involved. The FAA had a little bit of interest, but they went away pretty quickly. And it was up to us to find out what went wrong and to fix it. And I'm going to show you how to go through that process and we'll talk about the service plan. So, quick introduction by the ASI. The Air Safety Investigation Department, Technical Aviation, is responsible, um, to, mainly we act as the technical representative of the company to assist the NTSB in the course of their investigations. So anytime there's an issue with one of our products, typically a serious injury or fatality, they call us up and they say, hey, will you come back and help us? And we do that. So we're the rapid response team. We got our bags packed. We're the folks who are out the door on site with the NTSB. This is, excuse me, I found that as I've done these presentations, it's really a lot easier for me to talk about my job with just a recent experience. So this is three weeks ago. And you can see there I am acting as a technical representative to the NTSB, showing where the CBR was inside the airport. Um, a little bit more on that, and kind of how the process goes with us in the ASI department. That initial notification for this, this accident, this accident happened at 3.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, so 2.30 our time, and you didn't really hear about it until about 4 o'clock. So at 4 o'clock, I got the call, and I was launched two out on this accident. So I quickly got my paperwork together, grabbed my bed, I was at the airport, and I was on the 6 o'clock flight, got to Knoxville at midnight, 1 o'clock, I was in the hotel, woke up the next morning, driving over to Elizabethton, Tennessee, and I walked into the Elizabethan Airport at 8 a.m. and went right into the conference room where we get interviews with the pilots. After that, of course, the investigation kind of played out. There was a lot of media presence. Uh, the NTSB was very interested in the pilots' iPads and their planning, and the pilots were interested in their personal gear as part of the airplane survived the fire. So I was out on site there pretty quickly in the morning uh, with Adam, who was that photograph of us standing there in the morning. Um, we got into the cockpit and grabbed all their stuff, went back to the airport. We had a sheriff county deputy come out and fly a drone. He flew the runway, he flew the whole accident site for us. We got great pictures of that. And then um, the, uh, we did an interview with the Air and Arts later in the afternoon. And then Ralph, uh, Ralph Hicks, the investigator in charge with the NTSB, um, went out and did his press briefing. Then he had the police throw the cops out. So the, the police threw the media out. The media went away. And then all afternoon we worked on this site on uh, Friday afternoon. And then it rolled into Saturday morning. They wanted all of this picked up and out of the way very quickly because it was the Bristol race weekend. So they needed this highway. So we cleared it out as quickly as we could. Um, we made some follow up work, but we were able to get quite a bit of data out of that. And the interview process um, gave us a lot of insight into what exactly happened. So that's just kind of a teaser. That'll be next year. So if you want to come back, I'm covering that one. 
And then, uh, of course, all the investigation work is done. I come back to the company. I write a report for them there early as well uh, for our management. And then there needs to be a safety improvement there will be. So that's kind of how the very, very on the ASI department works. Uh, how often we're doing this is a question I get quite a bit. So I wanted to tell you, last year we had 1,277 notifications. This was the highest we've ever seen. And that is for all of our products, not just that. So that is all of our ladies and domestic products, the twins. This also includes all of these traffic assessment and offer. And this is worldwide. This is everything from the fatal and serious injury accidents that are going to be covered to the, you know, the starter generator, for example. Sometimes that makes the fun of the year round. Um, uh, over runs, you know, uh, uh, wind tip into a hangar, they make the Isaiah Cooley and they get the run. So we report all that kind of stuff. What was interesting about that 1277, only 55 of those were citation notifications, which again was higher than last year, but uh, still pretty relatively low numbers. And then of the fatal and serious injury accidents, 178 across the spectrum last year. Six of those were citations. I'm going to talk about those accidents for you this year. And I've added two more. We had another one um, last year where at 150 on departure struck the tail of the CJ4. Another one CJ4 was injured with the two occupants and the 150 were fatal injuries. So I'm going to cover that. And uh, we had a, another kind of near miss uh, stall on landing at the end of the year. And I added that one. Total investigations out of our department last year, we did 164 investigations with five people. Um, it was a very busy year. Four of those were citation launches that we went out on in the field. And um, of the 164, I would say it's like 102 of those who went out in the field. A lot of the stuff we do from our desk, especially the international stuff, they ask us for support and we're happy to do that. To dive a little bit deeper into the citation notifications, of those 55, we can release these runway excursions. Went at 11 in 2018. We had six taxiway excursions. So these are just the trend items that I was able to pull out of our accident blog of items that there are more than two. So seven bird strikes, three deer, one animal. We had three deer up landings in citations last year. And we had two more tigers in the yards. To give you perspective, again, so 55 notifications in 2018, then we had 43 notifications in 2017. But check it out how they stack up against each other. Yeah, we had more, we had less excursions, we had more in 17, we had more taxi leases. Equal number, it's both 17 people had trouble keeping their money on the pay, leading the way. Um, still, again, the higher trend is the road service. I was surprised when I saw that, I didn't think it would be as equal, but uh, it is. So, and then, uh, so the care plan is we have three nose gear collapses, and you can see the model three out there. We have two practice machines. Uh, this is a very busy slide. I really kind of put the slide in here for my own personal use because I use this to build all the case studies that I go through. But I did want to point a couple of things out, like the two assets that I had in the, the CJ4 and the 150. And then the 550 at the end of the year in Fargo. I had only had 11 people on board, stalled on the landing, they missed the runway, put it down in the grass. Uh, very lucky and fortunate in that case, and I'll cover that a little bit more in depth because that's a very photographs for you. The other reason I put this slide in here is because this gives me an opportunity to kind of take a pause and remind everybody how serious this nature of this information is. Um, I was trying to, I edited last year's video as well. Was, you know, it would be disrespectful if we didn't take the time to recognize that people are serious here if they were going to do this. And we use these case studies for purpose. That's really what it's all about. There are going to be nuggets of knowledge and useful information. Personally, I'm sure you will take away from these case studies that will make you safe. And that's, I think that's why I get right back. So I'm happy to be here, and I hope you guys can really use this information. Some of the things I'd like you to keep in mind as I go through these case studies are um, some of the topics or the trends that you see that they come out of. So that's like the lack of communication in the CJ4 and the 150. So think about your communication. Think about weather. You've got another accident where a guy flew into a thunderstorm. Your instrument currency and your proficiency. There is a difference, right? It's something new. It's going to be really good at. It's our kind of landing performance. You've got an overrun in here. Only one that actually resulted in a serious injury, but it's in my material. Look at the head injury. It's our kind of landing performance. Safety and security of the aircraft. And the aircraft that was stolen and intentionally crashed last year. Ground obstacle avoidance. You'll see that in a little while later. Personal minimums, situational awareness, and spatial disorientation, people coming out of the clouds and entering. 
stalls, you know, or the near miss in the video is definitely a stall. And uh, your checklist is going to be trained. If you miss an item on the checklist, I cannot tell you about how important it is for you to go back and run that checklist again. If you lose a distraction, if something happens that throws you off your game, please go back. You don't want to miss that critical step. With that, I'm going to get into the case studies, unless anybody's got a question. Feel free to throw something out. If you've got a question during this presentation, it's a lot of material. If you wait until the end, it's almost too hard to go back to. Uh, the first accident that we had last year in 2018 was April 3rd, and it's a CJ4, and this is the one there in the dam. The tail was struck. What happened in this case was the CJ4 was landing on runway 22, which is depicted by that red arrow in the slide. The 150 was in the process of departing on runway 15, the yellow arrow. And sure enough, together it's right there at the intersection. The 150 had just lifted it off as the, as the CJ4 was pouring out and the 150 struck the tail and sheared it right off the CJ4. And it looks like that. So all I'm going to share with you is publicly available information because these are still under investigation. I'm kind of working off the NTSB preliminary report from all these case studies. These are some of the media shots from helicopters flying over. Everybody on the CJ4 was fine. See just how narrow of a miss this was, so 10 feet to the other side, and we're in the middle of the cabin. The 150 immediately rolled over after the attack and struck the train right there at the intersection and then and the T14 and the T14 and the T14. Just a couple slides. Um, according to the NTSB's preliminary report, there were three people who witnessed this incident. They were all sitting in the airport lounge and they were all able to hear the unit count at the time of the All three said so they also looked out the window and they saw them. Two of them said they heard the 150 for sure on the unit count call and out of position. They pointed out the building airport. There's no control tower at that airport. It's all seen and avoided. We know. And this is not the first time they did this. This is kind of an own issue at this airport. Because at each runway beginning, there's a sign that states that the package using the opposite runway cannot be seen. It's kind of a normal one. It's a little hump that you can't see over. And it stresses to monitor the unit count in order to. Communication. Make sure you leave your call out. So make sure people know where you are. There is a CBR. There was a CBR. Come and look at CJ4. And the NTSB has it. We're going to make it to the laboratory. The reporter's laboratory in DC. And they've done a readout on it. And that will be part of the docket. We're going to try to make those final. It will take two years and then they have to be said to finalize the reports. But once you see that, the CBR will be on the public available and we'll be sure who was who was talking and who was talking. Who was talking. As far as uh, the next case study goes, April 15th of 2018, we had 1996 CJ. There it is before the accident in Crozet, Virginia. The flight scenario here is this guy taken off on Richmond Executive in Richmond, Virginia, and his plane was to fly over to Shenandoah Valley in Wires Cave, Virginia. You can see just kind of the Google Earth image with the red arrow showing his direction of flight, where he's going. Um, as far as the accident goes, night IFC prevailed. The preliminary radar showed that he had actually climbed up to about 11,500 feet at 2042 daylight time. And then he came down pretty quickly after that and leveled off at 4,300. That's four minutes later. He remained at 4,300 for another nine minutes to 2053. And he's just cruising along at 4,300. Then he began ascending left turn. The radar lost him at 2053. Again, here's the map. Shows just how far we got. You can see the yellow thumbs out there depicting the accident site. The NTSB preliminary report goes into detail as far as weather is concerned. Visibility was not good. 2.5 fishing miles, rain and mist. Sky condition was broken at 700. Overcast at 1500. Certainly not ideal. Uh, but I don't know if you're a visual person like me. Reading the textual piece of art isn't exactly easy to get the picture of just how bad it was. So, oh yeah, there was also light in the northeast and south of the river. Like that. That's what he goes through. Witnesses from the NTSB heard the screaming of the engines. They felt the train shake when it hit the ground. They said the ceiling was really low. It was raining heavily at the time of the accident. He came through a bunch of trees and terrain at an elevation of about 1520, and the aircraft was highly fragmented. Everything was there at the site during the investigation. Uh, both engines showed signs of rotation and impact. And give you an idea of just how high speed, how 
Brand went to that and got to some of the shots. I think the NTSB actually released these on their website uh, shortly after this investigation to show that they were up to. And there's more to that story. Uh, I personally have an opportunity every year, twice a year, I go back to the NTSB and I instructed the NTSB Academy for their first safety investigations 101 class. And I had a chance to talk to the investigator in charge of this accident. Because there's quite a bit of backstory in this that is, might give you a better idea. I mean, what puts a guy in mindset that wants to go fly in single pilot at night in the mountains, IMC, to a thunderstorm? He had just finished some training and he was at his girlfriend's house and they were having dinner and drinks and they got into a fight and she threw him. And she thought he was going to a hotel or maybe he'd go to the airport and sleep in his plane, but he didn't. He got in and he tried to fly. Toxicology, which is available, I didn't include it here, but it's already come back on this guy and that's publicly available. He had 0.08 in his system. 0.04 is legal, but uh, 0.08 is not. And just give you kind of a better idea, that will be in the docket when she found it was public with it. And I asked if I could share a little bit of that, and she said, sure, because you know, she gets that idea of why somebody would do this. So, you know, not, not a lot of safety benefits of this, other than the scenario, obviously, don't do that. But, um, yeah, let me put the two years. Um, in June, June 6th of 2018, by a two-pilot day in Central Bay, France, this is our overrun for the last year. It had taken off, we had a course to go, and it was flying over the bed, and it was coming into Central Bay. I still, I don't know why this guy flew this kind of approach. I don't know if he was just buzzing in the arena or what is it that he needed the time to get set up, because he didn't get set up or stabilized. Um, that's been the radar approach. The radar depicting his approach. And then here he is at touchdown. Uh, we're very fortunate that Aries was on board this aircraft and the aircraft was not destroyed and they worked pretty closely with the French EEA, their equivalency of the NTSB, to analyze that data and then to provide them some maps and trajectory of what happens. The red arrow depicts the very actual touchdown. It's about a third of the way down the front line. That run was only 3,871 foot long, 98 foot wide, and of course, there's a lot more the right line. It almost looks like he could have made it, right? What if I told him that he crossed the threshold at like 41 knots? <laughs> what if I told him that runway was a wreck? It was a this. Yeah, it was. And of course, it departed the end of the run. He couldn't stop me that. Down the hill and into the mountain with dirt, crushed in front of the airplane, and the captain came out to see if he wanted to sustain a serious injury between the rest of the bushes. Once serious, he was the serious, and then the end right seat. And then just a few pictures that were released through media reports. You can see in the bushes, and you can see just how much compression they have on those of that aircraft why it's just like a serious issue. 813 or 18. We had another CJ. This one was Basin City, Utah. There is the accident aircraft before the uh, accident. This aircraft was owned by a company called Van Con Holdings LLC. And the accident pilot in this case was actually an employee of the company. And he was, he was a pilot, right? He had a domestic dispute, and in the middle of the night, he went to the airport and he stole the airplane. And he intentionally flew it into his own coastal residence in an attempt to kill his wife and his child. Two occupants in the home were at the child, they had minor injuries, they were able to get out. And the pilot, of course, they didn't get here. A couple quick media shots of him just to know. It's my understanding he came in a little too low, he put the neighbor's garage and kind of threw the street in the front of the house. So he didn't really fully impact the house. And kind of just came the rest of the front yard and the airplane completely covered down the ground. Good job. Good time to try to And this is the case, when, when this is the case of an incident or an accident for us, we don't get involved in this. And the NCSB really doesn't get involved in this very much. This immediately becomes a criminal investigation. The FBI steps in and runs the investigation. The NCSB works closely with them, and the NCSB still issued a report in the case of this incident. Uh, we, we didn't get it out, well, we weren't asked to support it, but I just wanted to share with people what was going on here because what was really interesting to us when this happened was that two days before that accident happened with the citation, this one happened. This is the Horizon Air Q400 in Seattle, it was stolen by a maintenance guy, or it was a baggage camp, I'm not sure exactly what it wore, a lot of holes. Um, a lot of hats, and it did several things for the company. He stole this airplane. So he joined the airplane, because you will hear him say something. And uh, fortunately, there was a spectator who caught his right aileron roll that this guy was not doing there with bags. And he pulls this thing out of the bottom, like right? just over a few sheets out. Clearly, he had some, some 
psychological issues and was on the radio throughout this talk in the ATC. Talking to the ATC, he had another time. His whole mission was this. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. Right there. He ended up essentially crashing into the tip of the side. He was fatally injured, and the aircraft was destroyed. And I use this, uh, I think this case study, you can obviously see the, uh, the stolen aircraft, the safety and security of the aircraft. I hope that this kind of case study is everyone. If you're dealing with the your neck stands up, maybe you think twice about who you throw your keys to with your jet. Uh, maybe you have a little second thought about who has access to your equipment. Um, because you, you don't want to have this happen to any of your assets. 1126 of 18, we have a 2014 CJ down in Brazil. We did a little lay of our hands of Brazilian geography here, kind of down near the coast. Uh, this guy it was it taken off from uh, El Horizonte, and he had actually gone to his own private runway at his farm, which was a paid for you, a paid for you. Uh, He attempted to land on it. He came in, he came in too low, and struck his own irrigation system support fire to the main landing uh, Immediately turned the airplane, caused him to hit short to the left of the runway, the part of the airport fire to the left, actually kind of tumbled through some fields. Um, so the red line kind of represents the flight path in this slide. And right at the tip of that arrow, you can kind of see a white line diagonally across that field. That is irrigation line. To get a better close up of what's going on here, there's a, a beam racing guide wire system to support the weight of the water and the pipe in there. And that's what he had. He put it with his leg here. Uh, another just kind of give you a lay of land, visualize what's going on here. He's coming in. The black line there represents the pipe. He's in the first impact. The second impact just short left of the runway. Through the fields, across the ditch, falls the airplane up, and then it burns. The, the Brazilians have worked with many times over the years. They, they, they've said this a lot of this. That's why I'm getting this stuff. So these are uh, shots of them. Uh, the impact of the gear on the runway. Across the ditch, and expect you know, people on the site immediately got taken photographs of this smoke. And you can see just how significant the fire was. I for a while, really had to get around. And plenty of power on this thing. Obviously, this is an obstacle avoidance issue. And um, that's it. Then, 1130 of 18, 2009 5 CJ2 in Memphis, Indiana. It departed out of Jefferson, Indiana, which is actually just across the border from Louisville, just north of Louisville, Kentucky, inside Indiana. And the intent was to take off and fly up to Midway, the Chicago area. He had taken off, and uh, he climbed out the problem, made no radio calls after his departure. And then radar picked him up and turned to sending out to 6150, about five minutes after he was in the air. Uh, radar shows that you know, a rapid descent. And he comes through about a full 270 degree left turn before he, he starts turning. Last radar contact shows this guy coming at 322 knots, round speed, about 400 foot of AGL. Almost kind of looks like he tries to pull it out at the bottom and ends up going into trees um, at a kind of shallow angle, very high speed, left wing low attitude. Give you a visualization of the takeoff and departure, the turnaround, and then the arrow underneath the end number there to fix the direction he's found. Of uh, impact to the non-tangible of the exits. Again, radar is fully on hold. We've got this already, so it's publicly available and just going to give you an idea. At 11.26.56, uh, he's at 61.50 and 256 knots. 23 seconds later, um, he is down here at 175 foot, 400 foot AGL, 322 knots. Interpolate that radar data, it shows a descent of approximately 15,000 feet per minute. Brightest path through those trees, 1,200 foot long. Everything is there at the site, but it was in little bit pieces. And it looked like this. Just shredded through those trees, just shredded the airplane, and, and spread it out over a, a fan uh, space. Quite a large wreckage path. It's kind of a big close up there. How little the pieces are at that point. We probably the largest piece of 
five were these engines, the cores, the most of the left engine, the right engine core. The NTSB preliminary report, we're going to go as detailed into the weather and talks about how bad the weather was. So we were going to have to be able to right into the ceiling. And it was in most of the time. Uh, so it's kind of looking like a finish of this orientation accident. Camera I spoke earlier. I, I look at my job, I, I'm not saying anything about the camera accident, other than they were there. Okay. I have a little order of things. That's the way I look at my job. The fact is, there was a ton of speculation in the after this accident. Talked about that in this presentation about the fact that there were some red wings on there and the other events that they already had. I have no idea that anything to do with this incident. It doesn't sound like it did, but it's an ongoing investigation. It's probably not that we got it wrong. There's also beta data that we continue to look at. The areas that the aircraft still needs to be analyzed, and it was CDR. So once all that stuff is gone over, which is going to take well over a year for this investigation, I'm sure. The probable cause, maybe I'll come back and we'll revisit this one a little bit more in that. I'll work to find the probable causes. This is the nearest. Uh, 1130 of 18, we had 1985 50, Marjorie, North Dakota. There was the accident aircraft before the accident. Basically flying right across North Dakota in the diagonal paddock and going west down to the southeast and from Sululan Field, I guess, as I would say, uh, going to Hampton International Corridor. This was an interesting one. So he's on the high receiving conditions for bail. He's on an IFR flight hand. It's activated. He's talking to, to uh, ATC. And they seem to park control flight all on approach. The impacts to range to the right of the one eight. The pilot and one passenger were sitting there. The co pilot was not injured, and the nine passengers in the back had minor injuries. The aircraft was substantially damaged. And uh, they didn't want to. Before we end this, I would like to point out that this happened on 1130 as well, the same day as the Memphis Indiana crash. We launched the Memphis Indiana crash. We did not launch on this. In fact, this was actually originally reported as a runway overhaul. And since nobody was injured, the NTSB didn't go. It really didn't come up to the level of priority. We looked at this, another overhaul that really got out of the airplane. Not that big a deal. The FAA was out on site. It was kind of like the gear collapsed. And we won't go out on those kind of things. Um, in the NTSB preliminary report, we'll see here. Visibility was not good. It's five station miles were missed. Sky condition was overcast at 400 foot. And it's cruising. It's going on top and then deploying. Inside the preliminary report, it talks about how the pilot came through a bottom layer during his descent. It's 2,500 foot thick while on approach. He said that there was ice buildup on the wing and that he turned the boots on several times and the performance was normal. He also said that he broke out at 400 foot, there was clear clouds, and everything was A OK. He said he was right at center line, flew back on center line, and he was maintaining 120 knots. The same all the way. At about 100 feet AGL, the airplane starts pulling to the right. He says this is also the same. He used the left aileron, some left rudder to prep to get him back on the runway there, center bow. And then he didn't like it, and he advanced the throttles to go around. The airplane continued to the right. Impacted terrain, and we'll see in a second the result. The witness, there a wonderful witness, name, probably one of the better ones that I've seen summarized in the NCC preliminary report. Witness at the airport, sitting in his office, watched the airplane fall out of the sky. He said he saw the wings fluttering back and forth. He recognized the aircraft was about to stall. It was only about 130, 140 foot AGL. Then he says the thing tried to catch up, and right away he said the right wing went down. And he saw the belly of the aircraft and said it was like an 80 degree roll. Quickly came on when the aircraft was in the train. The co pilot, not the pilot, the passenger who was in the co pilot seat, says that uh, yeah, we were tricking up ice on the windshield and the right wing when I looked out there uh, during the approach to the clouds. The approach was warm, but everything was fine until we got near the ground and the aircraft started fishing. I suspect this is probably when the pilot's hitting the rudder trying to get himself in the front line. He's feeling that tail swing. He says at that point I saw the pilot go full throttle up the like he was going to go around. And that's when the left wing climbed, pulled hard to the right, right wing struck the ground first, then the aircraft had packed it on the belly. He stole it. He crashed into the right side of the door. And it ends up looking like this. So we didn't go, because we're thinking this isn't over. The FAA is out on site taking these photographs. And we got involved in this probably in January, February of this year, to support them and answer some of their questions. 
But these are some great shots that they were able to get on site. And so this again is why you need to be on site right away after an accident like this. You can see just how much damage to that right wing tip in that case all bent up. There's a good close up of just how much damage. What's really interesting is that all on site is where you got to get there right away. Half ice and half inch of mixed ice on the leading edge of the right wing, the vertical stab, the horizontal stab, and the AOA. See how the blades go over that mesh shield is? There's the wing. You can see the left horizontal stab completely glazed over. My favorite is in the circle. There's the AOA. You can see well over half an inch of ice on that track. And it's funny, I've done this presentation now twice, and both times I've had uh, the question nearly come up saying, well, why do these, why do these icing systems work? Do you know what they use these icing systems? Do you want to believe the pilot that says he turned them on, or do you want to believe the actual evidence on the aircraft that shows ice all over? You can see the damage to the left gear puncturing the wing. And just how much damage to this aircraft. This is a, the interesting part because this is how we got involved. The FAA is doing their investigation. They get the belted toilet in the back of the airplane. And you can see one of those belts is a nice kind of yellow, and the one in the background is kind of a brown color. And that caught their attention. Like, What's going on here, right? So they look at that yellow belt, they chase it down <coughs> to the anchor point, and they find that. The anchor point is pulled into a cable which mysteriously disappears into the interior paneling of the, uh, the floor. So they go back to carpet and they find that it's just bolted. This is not a suspect installation, okay? This is, this is a hillbilly maintenance going on inside of the jet, right? So, so that's, you think that's going to support the weight? How about that Okay. They did the other side and just bolted it to that, that flimsy angle iron there that, that supports the lab face. So that is not a structural component at all. Note no, all the duct tape at the bottom of the lab there. Yeah. Let's see what's going on in the general aviation environment. So, at the end of 2018, we had this 516 in Atlanta, Georgia. The intent was to take off out of uh, Fulton Airport in Atlanta and fly up to Memphis, but he never got out of the environment. Immediately after the departure of runway 18 out of Atlanta, um, which is the, the airport I'll make sure they for you real quick. Uh, he gets up to, he starts to climb left turn to zero one. He gets up to a maximum altitude of 3,700 feet, which is about 2860 AGI. And the radar's got him into a rapid descent. Impacts trees and terrain. Significant post impact fire. And all four of the this aircraft will take the injury. Here's the runway. Red arrow showing the departure. Uh, just a couple of specs from the ADSB data showing the initial climb out. And it looks like he kind of got into that left descending spiral and ends up coming down at a high rate of speed, actually rolls inverted, and then comes into a, uh, like a neighborhood park. It's a large football field in the area. Uh, strikes one side of it and ends up on the other. It's about 400 football miles. There's actually a video of this. And I talked to the NTSB and I said it'd be kind of nice to be able to show that in the name of safety, would you be okay with that? So here's some security video. And this was very useful in the investigation because this explains to us why we have on the left wing tip on the inside of the right half and the right wing tip on the left side of the wing. Now this is slow motion. This happens very quickly in a matter of seconds. But you can see the airplane go pull over nose down and into the trees. Sorry about that. Here's the wreckage pack. Um, right wing on the left side, left wing on the right side, and tumbled across that field about 400 foot long to the site on tap, where the tail and the bulk of the fuselage can be rest. Now this isn't like, this is a very busy environment. You know, people are really moving and working around in here, so people on site immediately photographs of the aircraft and the media on fire, uh, fire department shots uh, out of the site, put it out, you can see how far that can get is and how much fire damage and the tail on the other side of the field of the next defense. Again, highlighted in the NTSB's preliminary report with weather conditions. Not good. Seven statute miles, light rain. Overcast at 600 foot, we did take off into the clouds. And we saw the spiraling descent out of the clouds. 
This was an interesting example for us because this happened December 20th, uh, but it was like two days later the, the government shut down. Okay. So this aircraft was picked up, recovered to Atlanta, and it was just kind of put on hold as far as the investigation went. But they went back in February and they took a good long look at it and they it all out, got out the data they needed. Uh, there was an enhanced ground box box that went to the reporter's laboratory along with the CBR. So there will be good data. So I think there's a laundry list of items to consider as we went through this. I hope I hit on all those. I think I did. Um, I hope you keep a lot of these in the back of your mind as you're operating your airplanes. And uh, hopefully this will make a difference in your city. So that was it for the preliminary case studies. This is our company incident that we had at the end of 2018. This was November 9th, and that's our Delaware aircraft, Serial 26. It was a on a photograph of this aircraft because it's a regular airplane, so I just pulled out my favorite that I got online with the Nazi in the background here. The background of what's going on in this case, okay? Two guys on board, both company pilots. The guy in the left seat is one of our senior guys, and he's taking the guy in the right seat out for a proficiency training. He had just come back from some medical leave, so they were just out. They were to approach runs. They'd flown over to Hutchinson, which is a little short little hop to the west of us, and done some approaches into there. They made three landing approaches to Hutchinson. One went missed, one went touch and go, and one was a full stop. I just put this in here so you get a better idea during this session here. The landing gear is going up and down without any problems, okay? He comes back to Wichita after their approaches, and they line up from the ILS to runway one right. This is the shorter runway in Wichita, right next to Cessna, between the airport and Cessna. And they come in and they do a touch and go. He's got a left quarter and headwind at this point. He pulls the airplane back into the air. He pulls the gear up. Everything's good. He then goes into a right traffic pattern for one more landing. They're going to just do a VFR right traffic pattern and step back to the front of the He gets on his downwind for that last pattern. He puts the gear down. He sees two green and one amber. He gets the amber pass message. Here. Disagree notes. And notes. Uh, the gear gimbal is cycled. Same results. Now he's like, okay, let's confirm this. We fly a low approach, we're talking with control. Yep. Here goes, gear is not out. So, okay, they go around, they pull it back into the air, they fly out to the west practice area, and they run the normal emergency procedures to No problem. They get on the phone, they call back to the company, and they assemble the team. They call all the uh, production engineering group in, uh, production pilots over, everybody's brainstorming inside our production facility. So, trying to figure out other procedures and maneuvers they could do. And they did. They tried to the G-Lose system, they tried everything they could to try to get that nose gear out. No success. As a last ditch effort, they come back over. At this point, they knew this was kind of inevitable. Uh, they called me and I came over and walked in and got the refill and so on. They did two firm landings on the main gear, tried to knock the nose loose. No luck. And at that point, they were forced to intentionally land the aircraft with the nose gear back. In this case, they chose one left, the big one, 10,000 foot of leg from Wichita. And he stuck it right on the numbers, and he rolled out just past Delta 4. You can see there the red arrow. And um, within 30 minutes, we had an um, escort from the airport authority, and I was out on site. I was only down here in the office right after him. Uh, everybody else knew the launch, but they had stuff going on. So I went out there with my camera, and these are my photographs on site immediately. Uh, walking around, taking some overalls, I got down and started looking at the nose gear because obviously that's our focus of this investigation. And sure enough, the right gear door is on top of the left gear. If you're not familiar with the operation of this system, the right gear door is supposed to close first, and then the left gear door goes to the first the top. At the aft end of that nose landing gear door is this, oh, we're really along the whole strip. Along the whole door is this thing called the guard strip. That guard strip terminates at that aft end in kind of a funky trapezoidal triangular kind of shape to assist with that closing scenario of the right door first and then the left. Clearly not in that fashion in this case. Uh, they, they, we talked to the pilots and yeah, they tried everything. This is just their last ditch effort and everybody can talk to them. When the company personnel were in the thing, you know, pull that DNA you know, one more time, deform it if you have to, put everything you can to do it. He told us to put his flashlight in there. The last ditch after the video, it starts out as a D-ray, and that's why it looks like an over-ray. He was not going to get that nose gear out of there. Here's some of my runway shots. You can see he only skimmed that thing for about 200 feet, hard on the brakes, and got that thing stopped in a hurry. And he's right on the center. Wonderful job landing in 
walking away. These guys were both given safety awards, and the federal company's going to have no way to see it. So what happened? Okay. So what you're looking at there is the white nose near door, and you can see where clearly there's a pinch mark on it, where is it your left hand? What's in the circle there are the roller assemblies that are on the nose gear trunk. This is a very simple mechanical system. As the hydraulics drive the nose gear up into the wheel well, those little roller assemblies hit a couple of clevises, just these like the U-shaped pieces that are connected to the doors, and they swing those doors closed. It's as simple as that. Here's another shot of where those two came together in a pinch. And here it is in the aft end of that left roller that kind of triangular shaped piece that caused some damage. Witness marks of how it all came together. What we found during the investigation, when we were looking at those roller assemblies, was that if you push on it, uh, if we were able to move those a little bit. So first, three players observed at the aft end of the nose gear. So we isolated the system, we got a hand card in there, separated the nose gear, we were able to pump the nose wheel. And, and laying the gear steadily up into the wheel well, very slowly, as it made contact with those crevices and brought the doors closed, we noticed that there was a little bit of free play in the doors. We were able to do the push on the wheel. We found that if you push on that left door with 30 pounds of pressure, you were able to shove it underneath the right door. We also found that if you put like a light pressure on that door about 10 pounds and pulled on that right door a little bit, you were also able to get it in there and correct it. So what we, what we figured was that the headwind, the quartering headwind that he had on that last touch and go, was just right to push the left door in and kind of create a cupping action on that right door to hold it open. It caused them to close in correctly. When they did it, they came together and the geometry is such, they continued the retraction of the nose landing gear, caused them to scissor together right in the middle. And he ran it up, you know, the system runs 3,000 PSI. It just scissored itself together, jammed itself in, in the outer edge, and it just locked itself in place. You could not get it out. And we did this in the hangar. We didn't run up to the full 3,000 PSI because once we got to 1,500 PSI, it was wet. It wasn't coming out. We pulled on the cable. We could not drop it out. We put hydraulic pressure in reverse to try to force it out. We had up to 1,700 PSI and we stopped. We were all holding our breath, waiting to see what happened. About 15 seconds later, boy, I think he Stepping out of the wheel well fell in place. So we knew, we, we figured what was going on. We realized that the, the free play in the doors, and the looseness of the roller assemblies within the train had to be addressed. But was it a systemic issue? Engineering got involved and they went out and started looking at other airplanes. We went over to the service center, we looked at our proto, it was still in the engineering hangar, and we did it. We found some similar issues. Some other um, the doors can be rigged, minimal clearance at the aft end of those doors. When we looked at the aft end of these doors, just as they were about to close, it was about a quarter of an inch clearance. In the Katia model, the wonderful drafting world, is about an inch. Uh, you need really, it should be about, it should be between an inch and a half inch. The minimal is a half inch. You can see that here in a second. But you don't want to be rigged with minimal clearance. We also found that the free play on those roller supports caused those things because those are directly what drive those doors closed. So if they're off, and that can create a possible overlap. So, engineering knew they had to make a big change. And they recommended the service bulletin to be issued immediately. They worked with technical publications to draft it up the change, check the gap between the doors at the aft end, and free play in the nose of trying to roll the brackets. And this happened pretty quickly. This was right at the end of November, holidays through December, January, February, they were all over. Looking at other airplanes coming up with a fix. On April 11th of 2019, we had a service letter out to the fleet uh, for the 680 Yankee Global Attitude 01 through 177, and also 180 to 182. This is just a quick shot out of that service bulletin showing that roller assembly on the nose trunk that needed to be checked for proper torque. And then looking at the bottom of the nose, it's supposed to be a half inch minimum clearance at the aft end of those nose trunk in your doors in order to avoid this area of overlap. And since that is the same landing gear system that's also on your Sovereigns, and your Sovereign Plus, and your 10, other service letters were issued to those three as well. So if you have one of these airplanes, I always stress, you have this inspection done. 
And that's, that's it for the, the citation lab. Yeah, this is wonderful. So that's kind of blew through. Anybody have any questions?